Welcome to episode 15 of Virgo and the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. And joining me, as usual, is League Freak, who you can also find on Twitter at Fleague Freak. How you doing, mate? I'm doing pretty good. I'm looking forward to this episode. Uh, a couple of really interesting topics that we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so uh, let's not do dilly daydream a bit here. First off, mm-hmm. the cab. Um, Israel Folau. Yes. Well, they've spent a lot of money. They've taken three days. They've spent a lot of money on lawyers and things like that. And they've worked out that Israel Folau did something that they didn't like, which is really interesting. Um, I thought they probably could have worked that out a month ago. But the ARU have spent three days. They actually put out a, a uh, media release. I'll read it now. It says... The Code of Conduct hearing in the matter of Israel Flau has concluded in Sydney today. The panel of John West, John West rejects, uh, QC, he was the mm-hmm. chair, uh, Kate Eastman, uh, SC, what's SC? Um, something. Council, you'd feel like. Something council? Yeah. And John <laughs> Bulty, AM, uh, presided over the three-day hearing which commenced on May the 4th. Be with you. The panel has today provided a judgment that Israel Folau committed a high-level breach of the Professional Players' Code of Conduct with his social media posts on the April the 10th, 2019. The panel will now take further written submissions from the parties to consider the matter of sanction. A further update will be provided after the panel delivers its decision on sanction. Now, that's their whole media release. It doesn't really say much outside of the fact that they've given him the highest level that they can under the player code of conduct. And that allows them to open the door to sacking him without paying him. Um, There were rumours that they offered him a $1 million just walk away from the game settlement, and he rejected that. The ARU has since denied that, but this has turned into a real mess uh, for the ARU. And I just don't see how they get to any situation that makes them look anything but the bad guys. Yeah, they've um, they've really put their foot in here. I can, I'm going to say from the outset, okay, I don't agree with anything that that Israel Flower said, mm-hmm. and I, I, that needs to be said clear. But in yeah, saying we're not, that, not, well, neither of us are uh, defending what he said. It's more the situation that we're talking about. That's exactly right. And I think if we're going to be honest about it, um, the Rug- Rugby Australia made the error of getting involved because um, I think if this had been something that happened in the NRL. The NRL would have just let the player suffer the consequences of their own actions because they brought it on themselves so bad. I'm reminded of an incident a while ago, and I think it was Ryan Stig. He made some sort of comment as well. I can't even remember what it was now. I just remember the name. And the NRL just said, you know what? You know, we watched the answer. That's that's his opinion. That's his decision. He's free to say that, and he's free to defend it. And I think that's the sort of approach that Rugby Australia had, should have gone with. Because by getting involved, all they've done is put themselves in a lose-lose situation. And there's no winners here. Like, we're already hearing talk about dissension within the Wallabies. If he gets if he gets the boot, then the Polynesian players that are within the Wallabies side will not be happy because they agree with some of those views, or maybe even all of them. And if he doesn't get the boot, then the, the players who don't agree with his views, they're not happy with the decision either. So... Yeah. They've they've painted themselves into a corner that they and there's no doors around. They just can't get out, and so now they've come up with this decision where they they can essentially sack him without paying him out. And there's just too many grey areas in the whole discussion, which would allow Israel to sue them and put the cleaners through them because he could just argue, I didn't say anything. It's a picture that he posted, mm-hmm. and it's containing, I dare say commentary which is agreed upon by the bible i guess so it's it's not even based on a book that he wrote it's a belief he has and yeah. one last thing um the whole inclusion policy says that you need to respect people of you know race religion faith um sexuality all that sort of thing and too many of those things as we've just found out don't agree with one another and so you yeah. can't sit there and say right we're going to defend the homosexual people here which they've got to do, but you can't at the same time condemn another group of people because you're 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 being hypocritical towards your own statement where you everything's supposed to be inclusive. 
And that's yeah, not, and like that's if, not, if yeah. everything's okay, if we're supposed to be one big family and holding hands and singing Kumbaya, it, it doesn't work when you have um, different opinions on similar subjects and it, it really is a, a murky situation that I, and I've said this for a long time, I don't think sporting organisations should get involved in this sort of thing. I could understand if the ARU looked at his post and said, look, we're going to fine you over this because this is just, and for the most part, and I dare say that this is less about, it's less about these sporting organisations worrying about what really happens to the community and the effects on the community when a player says something. It's more about not wanting to have the PR situation that they've got to work through. Yeah. I don't. I, I really don't think they care, to be honest with you. I don't think, and it's not just the AAU, I'd say this about any sporting organisation, I don't think they really care about this sort of stuff, but I think they don't like the negative PR that comes out of it. Um, and that's why they have in place a lot of these code of conduct things. I think that if they had to find him in the beginning and said, look, we don't agree with it, we're finding you, and just got on with it, we probably all would have forgotten about this by now. It would have been in the past. Um, but they kind of made a, a rod for their own back in the sense that Israel Flower was doing this last year. They brought him in, asked him to stop, then gave him a massive contract extension and he pretty much immediately started posting this stuff again and now they're in a situation where they want to sack him but not pay out it's something like a four million dollar contract that Mm. he has i just don't see how they get out of this without being in a terrible situation because they either sack him and and it ends up in court and my guess is that any lawyer with their salt would be able to say, look, this guy's been sacked for his religious views and that I'm pretty sure that's illegal in Australia. Um, They sack him and pay him out, in which case they've lost $4 million to see their biggest star walk away from from the sport in a World Cup year. And, I mean, and I've said this before, I think he could be playing rugby league as soon as the rugby league club wanted him. I don't think the ARL would properly stand in his way. I think they'd fold. Um, or he go, he, even he just gets the money and walk, goes overseas and we never hear from him playing sport again. It's still a lot of money to give a guy to not pay for, play for you, especially for the ARU, who doesn't have that much money to throw around. I, I, you know, if they say, OK, we're going to fine him, even if they said we're going to fine him $100,000 for this, you're going to have issues with having to do a PR job on the fact that you've said we don't condone this in rugby union, but... He's still with us, you know, so I really don't know what they do. I I just think there's no good situation for the ARU, and I think that no matter what happens to Israel Folau, even if he walks away with $4 million in his back pocket, he's still going to be able to sort of say that he was a victim here, which is kind of strange. Um, And I don't, you know, I'd hate to be uh, in Raylene Castle's shoes. (laughs) (laughs) I think she's pretty hard to this sort of drama now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, look, it's because there's because of the conflict between the different views. Obviously, gay people and religion are just two things that are not going to mix. Um, if you're going to have an inclusion policy that includes both, then um, yeah, you've got to expect this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if. If it had been a gay person criticizing criticizing Catholics, yeah. whether we would have had the same amount of outrage, and I'm not yeah, saying that because um, I don't I don't say that because I think that one one group of people has more sway or anything like that over the other. Mm-hmm. I just think I just think that mm-hmm. there's less um, there's less interest in religion these days than what there used to be. Mm-hmm. So I don't think um, religious views are as passionately held today as they used to be. That's just my view. Mm-hmm. Whereas someone's freedom to to you know to be free to express their sexuality as they please is a right that I believe everyone should be able to have. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want you know 
I don't want to know that if my daughter gets older and she, you know, she, she learns that she's homosexual and she has to suppress it and hide and shit like that. I don't see how that's living a happy life. So, you know, the, the Catholics are allowed to live a happy, spoken life, you know, but homosexual people have had to be hidden away for so long. I don't think that they should be should be treated as lesser people. But in saying that, you've got these two different groups. Um, sometimes you just got to say, you know what, they're going to clash. We're going to have both within our ranks. We just have to accept that there's going to be disagreements in that area. You can't sit there and pick and choose one over the other. Because as I said, you know, what happens if down the line a gay person has within the rugby union has a go at someone Christian and they don't, they don't use this as a benchmark? Like the gay person doesn't get sacked. Yeah, and it causes a lot of, of friction where, I mean, I think, it, say Israel Folau has a gay teammate, right? I don't think Israel Folau is going to be, like, you know, throwing holy water at him and stuff like that. I don't think <laughs> that's going to happen for a second. Um, and these are obviously hot-button topics that are very easy to make a media storm out of. And I think the problem that we've seen here is that Israel Folau has posted something, which, I, I mean, and we, we've said it in a previous podcast, it's just I don't know why he did it. You know, I, I thought it was just stupid. Um, and if you go by his list, then, you know, most people are sinners that are going to hell. But, you know, the I think the ARU tried to stand up and try and put themselves on some moral high ground on the back of it. And I think it's blown up in their face. Well, it has um, because you, there's no moral high ground on either side of that argument because you're going to be you're going to be essentially indirectly attacking one minority group over another. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter which side you pick. And yeah, that's that's why it was. I think it was a bit silly that they decided to side one way or the other when they should have just said, you know what, this maybe this is a conversation that needs to be had. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe we can find a way to find peace within the two groups, at least within Rugby Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, they've used it as an opportunity to take a hardline stance one way or the other, and it just, to me, it sets a bad precedent. Um, yeah. And, this is going to be the last time this happens. Yeah, and like an inclusion policy, where's the inclusiveness of Israel Folau's views, exactly right. even if you don't agree with them? Because yeah. Israel Folau doesn't agree with other views, obviously, and he's made that pretty clear. The, the thing that I have a problem with all of this is that they, they Rugby Australia knew this is what they were getting. Hmm. They knew this is what they had. And even so, they gave him a long-term big money contract and now they've turned around and they've been like, oh, my goodness, I, you know, we can't have this in the game. And it's like, you, but you knew that this is what you were getting. Like it wasn't a, it wasn't a shock to anybody at all. And they've just made a rod for their back, and there's just no way that they come out of this smelling of roses. And we've already seen, and I don't know what his name is, but that Tongan Thor player that plays for uh, Queensland Reds, I don't know his name. I don't follow Rugby Union at all. But I saw some quotes from him where he was pretty upset that this was all going on. And he was basically saying that uh, they might as well sack all Polynesian players now. Now, I don't think he talks for all Polynesian players. I think that, you know, everybody needs to be judged on their individual values that they show in life. I, I don't, I'm very against just lumping people together for the most part. Um, but I think no matter what way they go with this, it, it's really going to hurt them and it's going to be a massive PR nightmare and it could be a financial nightmare as well. And it's going to be really interesting to see what the outcome to this is because, if, in, as I said, in the beginning, if they'd whacked him with the big fine, I think everyone gets on with life. But because they've allowed this to drag out, they've basically turned this into the worst-case scenario for rugby union in Australia. And I think as every day goes on, Israel Folau gathers support from different people in different areas of the community, um, even if it's just people within his own religious community and their voices are getting louder and louder and it's it's turning into a bit of a mess and I I am very glad that it's not something I'm involved in because I think that everybody comes out of this 
it looking pretty bad. Yeah, no, it's um, it's just the thing that gets me is the fact they've got that inclusion policy and they're mm. basically just ignoring it for one person, but mm-hmm. not for the others. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you're going to make a policy like that, then you've got to accept that there's going to be this sort of stuff go on. It just, it's just nonsense. It, it really is nonsense. So let him have his views. Mm. You know, you, you're not, you can't go around trying to suppress people from from their religious beliefs. That's that's a horrible thing to do. Just like you know, you can't suppress people from, you know, if, if they if they want to reveal that they're gay or not. Mm. You, shouldn't, you shouldn't be going around trying to suppress people or, or you know anything like that. It's just that's not a harmonious place to be in. And so the I, uh, I, the Rugby Australia have failed have failed their own inclusion policy with with Israel Folau, and I think that alone will be something that he can he can I think have grounds to sue them on the mm. the being sacked because of his um, religious belief. I mean that's discrimination as well. Even though he's displayed discrimination himself towards other people, um, that's part of his religion. So, you know, it's. I think he's got a lot of. He's got a lot of good chances of of taking them to the cleaners on this one. He, I don't, and I wouldn't be surprised if he goes to more than four million. Um, and I don't know that Rugby Australia's got much of a leg to stand on when, if they try to fight it. Yeah, my guess is they wouldn't. But I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. Um, the, the other thing I don't like, and this is with all sporting organisations once again, is where you get a sporting administration trying to have uh, effects on, on society and, and putting themselves like on any sort of moral high ground. And I've said this many times before with the National Rugby League. Um, there's times where I just want to sit down and watch a game of Rugby League and I'll be bombarded by messages about, like, you know, don't become a gambling addict, um, don't engage in domestic violence, you know, go and, go and get cancer checks and stuff. And it's like, can I just, buddy, watch a game of football, please? You know, <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't need your advice, NRL. I, I'm pretty fine as it is. Just put on the game, blow the bloody whistle. And so I don't like it when these sporting organisations all of a sudden do this sort of thing. I don't like it when corporations do it especially. Um, and we've seen a lot of that sort of stuff from corporations over the last couple of years. I think it's gross. I think that it's it's trying to manipulate things. I think it's trying to manipulate the media. I don't think they that most of these places honestly really care. I think they do it just for brownie points. And uh, I think when push comes to shove with most of these organisations, they really show their, their true colours when it comes to time to make some money or make sure that they get talent on their books. Now, in that sense, Rugby Australia is going in the opposite direction. They're probably going to lose a lot of money on this and they're going to lose some talent. But at the same time, they're, they're just focus on running Rugby Union. You know, what are you doing? Yeah. They're spending all of this time and money focusing on this, which is kind of like a, a media, you know, social issue when they really should be spending time and money just running the game of Rugby Union in Australia, which is going really, really poorly right now. So, And that's one of the things that jumps out at me over this as well. Yeah, it's... Um... I, I do agree with what you're saying before to about all that that um, social welfare stuff that, especially in the NRL, do. I think the, as you're saying too, the NRL does it largely to counter the negative press they get. Yeah, um, and a lot of that press is unwarranted, but it's they're they're doing all of this stuff in communities to show how how good a brand they are. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it can get a bit can get a bit carried away. I I agree yeah. with that. Yeah, um, when you see certain players in the NRL running out on with white ribbons on their bloody jerseys, I mean, give me a break. Yeah, especially if it's like Matt Lodge or Robert Louis. Yeah. Um, God, that was horrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, no, I, I get what you mean there. I I don't know how the RO, the, the Rugby Australia deals with this. Um, I I think they've I think they've shot themselves in both feet. Mm-hmm. Yep, pretty much. Um, All right. So let's move on to our next topic, which is a little bit more fun, but <laughs> we get stuck into another <laughs> sporting organisation. 
Yep. Yeah. Okay. We're going on back onto rugby league, and this is going to be about the uh, Magic Weekend, which is going to kick off uh, tomorrow. And as you've no doubt been inundated within the media and the NRL themselves, um, they're telling you how fantastic and great this is. And to the casual observer, it probably is. But for me, I think it is a really dumb idea. I, you know, the reason why it works in England is because they don't have a national footprint over there. You know, they've got the north of England along that um, that highway corridor they've got out there in the north there, and that's yeah. about it. So they take the Magic Weekend to places outside of that to try and promote the game around the rest of England and try and get it more more um, well known out there. Whereas, so you know, it's a it's a um, marketing tool for them. And yeah, and then does that come in with because they had to move away from Wembley Wembley Stadium as Wembley was getting rebuilt, which is where the Challenge Cup final was, and so so they started moving the Challenge Cup final around, and they realised that they had something on their hands because rugby league fans got a chance to get away to somewhere different, whether it was Cardiff or or um, I think they had a game in Edinburgh and and places like that. And so it was a, a, a chance to get away. It was like a, you know, an event that was away from the normal heartlands of the game. And then when the Challenge Cup went back to Wembley Stadium, which was fantastic that it got back there, I think the Rugby Football League realised that they could still have that event that was on the road and that gave them a chance to really promote the game in a new area. Now, at one point they had it in Manchester, which I thought was a bad idea, but you know, if you move it around a little bit, it, it makes sense over there. But it's a much smaller country. You've got a supporter base that is conditioned to travel because they're not travelling all that far to begin with. Like a, a trip from, say, St Helens to Hull to watch Hull FC, it's it's a decent enough trip, but it's not too much further to go down and watch your team playing Carter, Cardiff either uh, at, at the Millennium Stadium, whatever they call it these days. So it sort of made sense over there. And I remember when Shane Richardson, who works at the uh, the Rabbitohs, was saying that we should have it over here. And I'm like, well, the dynamics are completely different. And somehow it, it gathered momentum. And now we're seeing it promoting the game in Brisbane, apparently, where I know the game in Brisbane's really struggling for <laughs> media attention and, you know, crowds and everything. It it makes no sense. Yeah, Um I argued all along that if, if we have to have Magic Week in Australia, it should be a promotional tool, and we should be putting it in places where we're thinking of expanding the game to. So, mm-hmm. first place off the cup, top of the top of the um, tree would be we have we should have had this in Perth this year. Mm-hmm. Yep. They've got that magnificent big stadium there. Put all sixteen teams there, and play all the games there, and just absolutely inundate the entire city with rugby league for an entire week, mm-hmm. and just get those people at fever pitch about it and get them in there and you go, right, we know these people here love it. We know we're going to get it here. You know, you use that as a as a building block to get that team over there. And, it, you know, we've been mucking around for so long to get a team in Perth. We, we really need to start moving forward on that a lot, a lot more quickly and things like this would help. Um, other places you'd go to would be places like Adelaide, you take it to like the South Island in New Zealand, you know, even, even Melbourne if you need to when they're, you know, and a crazy idea would be in that week off where AFL has a week off between their last round and the, and the first week of the finals. Imagine if you put Magic Weekend at Dockland Stadium or the MCG on that yeah. one week off when AFL's all having a rest and then all of a sudden the whole city is just swamped with rugby league. That's how you use it. You don't yeah. take it to a place like Brisbane where everybody just loves rugby league and watches it anyway. You're not... You're not doing anything with it. It's just a, I just see it as a waste of time having it in Brisbane. It'd be like if you put it in Sydney. Like, yeah. It's not going to work. There's no point to it. Exactly. All you're doing is alienating a, a ton of fans who probably can't afford to go there because, as we know, as soon as you put one of these big events on in a city somewhere, all the hotels jack up their prices, and it automatically just leaves a lot of people unable to go. And so these people will all be sitting at home watching it on TV where instead they'd rather be going to the game and watching it there and having a proper event. And it's just, you've just alienated a whole heap of fans, especially those in Sydney. Um, yeah, and, and you've, as you say, it's got to be something where you take over a city. Like, I like the idea of going and having the entire round played in New Zealand. Like, and I would play it in the North and South Island and just be like, you know, 
just take over. Just be like, this is a whole rugby league weekend in New Zealand. We're, go- we're playing games everywhere. Um, play. Make sure you don't play games in back-to-back at the same stadium. I would play them in different stadiums everywhere. And make it this giant promotional festival across the whole country. Um, I like the idea of taking it to Perth as long as you're doing that while you're announcing that Perth gets an expansion club. Yeah. Um, you know, even Melbourne, if you look at Melbourne, as you say, when they've got no AFL down there, you could play games at the MCG. You could play games over in Geelong. You know, just go in as many different places as you can and and sell it as a festival of rugby league where the games actually count towards the premiership round. So they're not, ju- not just exhibition games or pre-season games. They're the real deal. Um, I, I see zero value in having it in, in Brisbane. I I see zero value in having it in Sydney. Um, And to me, I mean, they're talking about, they'll talk about how many, uh, how many, you know, people are at these games and stuff. I would dare say that the accumulated crowd for the weekend will not be uh, any more than we would normally see at at, um, any game in particular. But, the other thing is, too, I think that the clubs themselves probably signed off on this, or most of the clubs signed off on this for the fact that they don't have to pay for fees for their own grounds and and having everything open themselves. Like, I think that this is probably a cost-cutting measure for, the, for most of the clubs, um, having the NRL take over a stadium and, and pay all of the money for that. I would suggest that most clubs are saving quite a bit of money this season by having the, all of their games played at Suncorp Stadium. Yeah, and I dare say the, the NRL's getting a fair bit of uh, coin in the pocket from the, the Queensland State uh, Government as well, which mm. I dare say the clubs are getting a, a bit of that pie too. So, yeah, I can I can see it from, from the club's point, but it just... It, that's the only benefit to it. The rest of it is just is just nonsense as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, <laughs> what, do you, what can you do? Um, i am always been big on having the game being promoted in, in new areas or areas where the game is struggling. And so yeah. I hated the fact they scrapped city versus country because, yeah. you know, the argument was one that I'd seen time and time again, especially with New South Wales versus Queensland before Origin, that is... Oh, you know, the team from Sydney or slash New South Wales always wins and they always flog them. What's the point of this game? And they don't see it from the perspective of the people that were in Queensland at the time or in country New South Wales, mm-hmm. where they just want to barrack for their team and see how they go against the big boys from the big smoke. Yeah. And you take away city country, you ruined all of that. And it, as much as we see NRL games going back there, and you get good crowds and whatnot, but there's no real kick on from it. Just everyone goes because it's an attraction. Oh, look, it's like it's like bringing a band to the area. You know, if Metallica went and played in Wagga, everyone would flock to see it. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And then after that, they'll just go back about their lives. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, it's not helping grow rugby league in that area there because the, the people aren't going along to watch a team they are passionate about, which is someone representing them. They're just watching a team yeah. they usually watch on TV. It's just, oh, they're, they're down the road today. Yeah. So, you know, I'd, I'd rather we had better emphasis on country rugby league. I've got yeah. lots of ideas. Most of them are probably un, you know, unreasonable because of costs and stuff like that, but something has to be done. Now, that Riverina area has been getting chewed up um, big time by AFL for well over a decade now, um, and it used to be a massive rugby league nursery. It still has mm-hmm. plenty of players coming out of it, but you know, it's, it's a common theme going on around uh, country Australia. Yeah, I mean... I think the NRL does a decent enough job in a lot of circumstances in that they do take premiership games to these country areas. And, like, I can't think of another Australian sport that does that. I don't think soccer does it. I don't think AFL does it. But the thing the AFL does well is that they do the grass grassroots mm-hmm. work in those areas where, as you say, the NRL for in a lot of cases, turns up, puts on a show and leaves, and they don't do the follow-up work. And that's why I think when you go to Perth, even with the State of Origin game in Perth, it's got to be where you announce that there's a team. Otherwise, you're just putting on a show and you're leaving. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like I, I would like to see the NRL do more work in those areas. Um, but then it's, I mean, 
you've got to wonder how much they're spending in and and whether they're spending it in the right way like i would be i mean in in some of these country areas i'd be pushing touch football i'd be pushing obviously the full game of rugby league um and just making it easier to play the game trying to keep down costs for registration and things like that uh, and I don't know how much work has been done out there. Look, I've, I've lived in Sydney all my life, so it, it's not like I can pretend to know what really happens in the country. Um, but I, I know that I, I think it was a good move to get rid of the country rugby league itself because I think the double up of the administration was a bit ridiculous. Um, where you had the New South Wales Rugby League was basically looking after Sydney and the country rugby league was trying to look after everything else. I thought that was ridiculous, but... Um, I don't know that once we've streamlined the the administrative setup in rugby league that it's actually done anything to add it, like maybe with them costs that were saved that that money flowed back into country rugby league. Um, and, you know, more can always be done. That's that's one thing. But I think definitely when we take these games to new areas, you've, it's got to have a follow-up. It's got to be for a reason. It can't just be put on a show we take the money, we take the local council's money, and then we, you know, wave and we'll see you next year. We can't be doing that. No. And look, there's simple things they can do which um, which would help. So you could have like a, a um, you know, start televising games from the bush. If mm-hmm. it's something like um, Group 9 versus Group 2 or something like that, pop it on TV or, you know, occasionally take them up to Sydney and put them on before a big NRL game and actually give it the same treatment as an NRL match. Mm-hmm. And it's just that little bit of extra effort, that little bit of extra emphasis. And it's not, I don't think it would cost that much money to do it. It would have such a big kick on effect in the game in those areas there. You're getting all of these unknown players are getting recognition. You've got all these people putting more eyes on it. You're getting more interest in the game outside of Sydney. Um, I can't see a negative to doing simple things like that. And the, the little steps that wouldn't cost much money or time for the NRL to do but they'd have just a huge effect on grassroots footy all around the country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And it like it would be really good if they could set up some sort of... And, and we've seen it a little bit. It's getting better and better. We can get to view the lower grades of the game. And some of them are shown on, uh, I think, YouTube. They put them straight on YouTube. Mm. Um, it would be cool if they started doing that for some of the country games. Um, I don't know how many people in the country have the internet infrastructure to be able to watch those games live, but there would be some people that would be able to see them that normally wouldn't be able to see them. So that would be handy. Um, And I I also think what I would like to see in the off season is a national coaching clinic set up by the national rugby league where they just get out to different areas with different players and things and really promote the game, promote how to play the game to, to young kids I think that would be fantastic if that's what we saw every off season, because I think that's a real hole in the in the development pathways of the game. Just having like our star players, and look, you're not going to get every star player, but getting players that are first graders out to different areas and doing coaching clinics and things like that, um, and getting young people excited to want to play the game of rugby league. Exactly, and the good thing about that is it's going to take a lot of those players away from doing dumb shit in the off season. That would go and create bad press for the club for the game. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Oh, jeez, they get me started. <laughs> Think of all the all of the kiddies Adam Elliott could have helped instead of putting his dick in a glass of beer or whatever well, you know, it was he did. <laughs> I just thought he didn't know how to drink beer. It's just like you know, trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> is this a straw? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> if it is, that doesn't taste very good. <laughs> Get oh, a bit blue. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So I think we're we're pretty pretty much in agreement on both subjects. Rugby Australia is stuffed, and Magic Weekend is a stupid idea. This has been a really good podcast. <laughs> yeah, uplifting. I'll tell you what. Yeah. I'll, I'll put it on a high. Okay. I released a tweet today. Yes. All right. Between the. Um, all of the premiership games played in the New South Wales Rugby League slash ARL slash NRL and the finals games, um, the two all-star games, all of the internet, interstate games between New South Wales and Queensland prior to origin, all of the state of origin games and every international game ever played at Lang Park slash Suncorp Stadium 
It's a total of 450 games, and they've had 12,938,149 people go through, which means at Magic Weekend, we are going to see Lang Park actually have its 13 millionth person come through from those games. And they're just 61,851 people short of that mark. Wow, that's incredible. Like, wow, that really shows how strong rugby league is in Brisbane. <laughs> I'm really glad that we're playing all round of games there. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> but oh, that, that mark should be, I dare say, that'll be topped in the first game on Friday. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got a game tonight, at, uh, and that's Titans versus Sharks. So... Right. Yeah, first game Friday, West Tigers versus Panthers. Oh, our teams are playing each other. Ah, how funny wow. would that be? Had the 13 million, 13 million people come through to watch a game in Brisbane that won't have a Queensland team in it. Yeah, that is pretty funny. The, well, the one after that is Broncos versus Manly. I don't know how they're going to split up the uh That's the actually listed as... I actually think that's actually listed as a Manly home game too. Well, yeah, I'm on here it is. Uh, I'm looking at the NRL website. Manly's listed first on this one. Um, the West Tigers had the home game against the Panthers, so uh, and the, like the odds look like they're even. We don't get talking about betting on here, but who do you reckon's going to win that one? The the uh, what are we gonna, the, the butterfingers yawn fest between the Tigers and the Panthers. Yeah. Jesus. Um. Oh boy. I look. My heart, my heart says Tigers. Mm-hmm. My head says I don't know. Like if if Benji Marshall plays, mm-hmm. then I'm thinking that the Tigers are are a better chance. But with Maloney getting off, and he's about yeah. three weeks away from playing Origin, mm-hmm. um, he's the sort of bloke that can just can pull a, an absolute streak of great games together at the drop yeah. of a hat. And all he needs to start that role is to come up against a team that's playing like crap like the Tigers are. Yeah. I uh, See, I think I wouldn't be surprised if the Panthers fired up for their second game of the year in this one. Um, and I think they probably needed to play an opponent like the Tigers that wasn't in terrific form just like, the, I mean, because the Panthers are in terrible form. They need someone to play down to their level to look like they're going to win a game. But I think the, the winner of this game will be Rugby League. <laughs> the winner of this game will be full time. Yeah. Um, oh I I just see this as being another match like the last one I played a few weeks ago. Yeah, I do too. I, it'll, it'll just be, be like bad bad options by the bad options by the Tigers and bad discipline by the Panthers yeah. and just oh man, I'm I'm not looking forward to it. Not because I think my team's going to lose, but but just I just think it's going to be a real bludger of a game. It's, well, that's one thing about this magic weekend they're having, right? Have you heard any promotion about any of the individual games at all? None. <laughs> None at all. It's like the, it's just like it's like one big blah event, and none of these games. Like that's a really inter- that's an interesting game, even though both teams are playing terribly. Manly versus Broncos will be interesting because you just want to see how the Broncos are going for that one, and Manly's going pretty well. Knights versus Bulldogs. I'll make sure that I've got plans for that one. Um, <laughs> Dragons versus Warriors could be a really good game on Saturday afternoon. Storm versus Eels could be a really good game. That's fourth versus fifth. And the Roosters playing the the Raiders, that's, that's first the one. versus third. You know, that's, that's the a one great I'm, game. That's the one yeah. I'm keen to see. You know, the... And then we've got the Rabbitohs playing the, the Cowboys who, you know, the Cowboys really need to put on a decent performance in this one because a loss here really... That might put them out of any, you know, thoughts of getting into the eight. So there's some games here that really do matter, but it's just there's been no promotion at all about the actual games of football. It's just been more a, a case of like, oh, we're doing this thing, and and that's it really. I mean, even the NRL um, Twitter account they changed their logo to a, a green M, and it took me bloody ages to work out what the green M was. And I'm a rugby league fan. I'm like, what is this M thing? <laughs> like, oh, oh, it's magic round. All right, uh, well, who cares? You know. But, so was, it, it's very strange. I was going to say, I'm surprised they haven't pulled, pulled out some more um, Wayne Bennett returning to Brisbane commentary well that's what i was thinking like there's no, <laughs> the thing that got me thinking about that just now was there's no more cleary versus the west tigers going on 
You know, that three weeks ago, that was the storyline heading in. And now it's like, oh, yeah, it doesn't even exist anymore. I, th- I think the media might be cutting on to the fact that trying to talk up a, a rivalry between coaches doesn't actually talk anything up because people don't get a payoff. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah so, exactly. Oh, it's Cleary versus the Tigers. And you go, yeah, all we saw was just two teams bumble around for 80 minutes and then no one scored any points and it was dull. Yeah, and no then they did, did it again with they did it again with 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 um Bennett and Seabold, and yeah. you're sitting there going, we still didn't get anything. Like the South just won that game convincingly and just strolled home. Mm. And went, okay, what about that big rivalry? And so I don't see it as as promotion of the game. I see it as a distraction from the game. So do I. I think most people do as well, yeah. and, and I think this. The way that this round has been marketed, there's been zero emphasis on the actual games of football. This is right. It's a it's a real worry the the way the game is sort of being advertised and pushed. It's like they'll, they'll try and find any flimsy reason to talk about it, but a lot of it it's not actually about the actual game. Hmm. I was actually well, thinking maybe maybe we could probably start our own promotion thing up where we could talk about two referee clashes. Yeah, that'd be good. How will they, these two uh, work together? Yeah, you, who would you go for? You'd go for Ashley Klein and uh, what's uh, Henry Perinara. They're two that people fire up about. Well, maybe maybe Tim Roby and Henry Perinara, given the cultural differences between the fact that one's from New Zealand and one's from England. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're clutching at straws here, but, I mean, isn't that what it's all about? That's what the media does. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, yeah. I, I heard someone on a TV show saying they don't like each other. So there you go. Ooh. Yes. I've got nothing to back got nothing to back that up, but ah, there you go. Don't, don't worry about don't worry about sources, <laughs> mate. Oh jeez. Well don't worry about that. I think that's been a good episode. We've uh, basically rubbished two different sport sporting organizations and uh, that should be an uplifting thing to go into tonight's game for the uh, you know, Titans versus Sharks. Hang on, it's tomorrow's game, isn't it? Oh, it's tomorrow's game, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Mixing my days up. Yeah. It's all right. Or you'll just defy me and put this up tomorrow and I'll just look like an idiot then. Ah, I should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> that all righty. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, all right. So you can find us all over the place on the internet. As I said, as we said last time, you know, go to YouTube and subscribe and... Um, you know, like all the videos on there, that'd be awesome. Go on to iTunes and subscribe on there and give us, click on the, the uh, you know, five-star review and you put something on there. We'll, we'll um, give you a, a mention. Um, we'll have to do uh, another episode where we talk uh, about... Uh, Spotify, YouTube, Pornhub. Um, we're just everywhere, really. Pornhub. <laughs> <laughs> give it time. <laughs> trying to figure out how that works ah oh, you just don't want to know no okay <laughs> we've got stuff to do now <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah by the way it reminds me we to talk to you about something and go for it <laughs> <laughs> click 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 <laughs> oh, uh, yeah so look everyone you your yeah, support's been fantastic the the downloads are going through the roof too at the moment so you know keep keep shooting in that's fantastic and um yeah we'll catch us all later bye everyone